familiar story. I will not read it all. And I'm going to read from the fourth chapter of 2 Kings. Please turn to it. Follow me as I read it. I'm going to read from verse 25 and give you the conclusion of the story. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off that he said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her. And say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, It is well. When she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away, and the man of God said, Let her alone. Another, another translation says, Peace. For her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, I love this woman. She said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did I not say, Do not deceive me? Then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins and take my staff in thine hand and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not, and if any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. The mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose, and followed her. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child, but there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awake. And when Elisha was come into the house, behold, the child was dead. The child was dead. And laid upon his bed. That's the prophet's bed. He went in, therefore, and shut the door upon them twain, and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child, and put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands, and he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned, walked in the house to and fro. He went up, stretched himself upon him, and the child sneezed seven times. And the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, Call this Shunammite. So he called her, and when she was come in unto him, he said, Take 
up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. What a story. I couldn't think of a better story to read on a night that we're tabbing and declaring to be a special miracle service. This is a special miracle. Now, I know that modern day press and reporters do not believe in the power of God. And when they hear stories about somebody being raised from the dead, they laugh about it. They ridiculed Oral Roberts for saying that he raised somebody from the dead. But the world has no understanding. Mr. Reporter, I dare you to dig up Elisha and interview him. This is a story of a miracle that took place as a result of a woman's faith. All things are possible to him that believeth. Can I say that one more time? All things are possible to him that believeth. And you can stand there erect with your shoulders back and say, I don't believe it. Then it never will happen for you. It's only possible to them that believe. And you can mark me down as a believer. I believe that God can do anything. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, you're a fanatic. I know it. Let's settle that thing right now. When I served that devil, I was a fanatic. I did things people just dreamed about. But I was a fanatic. And now that I'm saved, I'm a fanatic. You see, the world has their fanatics. You have them right here in Los Angeles. You've got more fanatics in L.A. than anywhere. Fanatics in the world I'm talking about. They jam stadiums. Only they don't use the term fanatic. They cut it in half. They're baseball fans. What they're saying, they're baseball fanatics. But now it's football. Football fans. Football fanatics. Hockey fanatics. But I'm a Jesus fanatic. I eat Jesus. I sleep Jesus. I walk Jesus. I talk Jesus. Everything is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And don't turn the TV set off. I believe Jesus is on television. the question was asked how many needed a miracle about three quarters of this audience put their hand up but Paul you said how many of you are expecting a miracle that's the way you put it and you lost some of them <laughs> not everybody that put their hands up originally put their hand up because they may not be expected. And if you're not going to expect it, you're not going to get it. Some of you are hoping. You've tried everything. You've tried the fortune teller. Don't turn the television set off. Some of you tried the Ouija board. Some of you tried the root worker. You've tried everything. 
And now you're going to try something else. It won't work that way. I had a lady come through my prayer line one day and she said, I tried Oral Roberts and didn't get nothing. I tried Morris Sorella and didn't get nothing. Now I'm going to try you. I said, that's what you think, old girl. You're not going to add my name to your repertoire. This way out. That's why you haven't been getting anything. I said, why don't you try Jesus? They've been trying him for 2,000 years. And I want you to know Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. And Jesus is the life. And he is the only one that can bring a miracle into your life. Raise your hands and shout amen. Bow your hearts and let's pray. Father, we thank you for the moving of the Holy Spirit tonight. I come against every opposing force to faith. I come against fear and doubt and unbelief. And I bind it in the name of Jesus. And I command faith to come alive in every heart as the word of God is preached. Lord, even before hands are laid on people, let miracles transpire. These people in wheelchairs, let them feel the surging power of the resurrected Christ coming alive in their body. Even while the word is being preached, let them get up out of them chairs and start walking. In the name of Jesus, let blind eyes see. Let deaf ears hear. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, let miracles take place. Save every lost sinner. Lord, everyone that's viewing the telecast tonight, that tuned in, let this be the night for a miracle in their life. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody shouted amen, amen. and amen. Now I read in your hearing tonight the final act in the life of this Shunammite woman. The miracle that she received. But there's a prelude to this story. This woman was a great woman. And she enjoyed the pleasure of a good life. And she provided meals for the man of God when he would come by. And the man of God finally declared to Gehazi, I think we found a good thing here. Every time we come, we're going to stop here. And the woman got a hold of her husband and said, Well, the man of God's making frequent visits. We might as well knock a hole in the wall and build a room for him. And he'll have his own room and have his own entrance so he won't have to stay in the local hotel. He'll have a place here. So on one occasion, while he visited this particular part of the country, he was in the room with Gehazi, who is his servant, and he said to Gehazi, find out what the woman needs. She's been so good to us, maybe we can be of service to her. And Gehazi went to her and just flat asked her, is there anything the man of God can do for her? I ain't doing this for him, I'm doing it for God. I don't need anything. He went back to the man of God and told him the story and but Gehazi said, there's something I noticed that she doesn't have. She is barren. There's no children around this house. Her husband's older than she is. And if there's anything you can do to help her since you know how to work miracles, why don't you do something in that way and let the woman be blessed and have a child? So on his way out of the house that particular day, he looked at the woman and he said this to her. I want you to listen to this. He spoke words of life. That's the way I like to put it. He spoke words of life to this woman and he said, About the time of life, you are going to bring forth a son. And he shocked her. And she said, Don't lie to me, you man of God. 
You walk to somebody in a wheelchair and look them in the eye and say, God's going to heal you tonight, and they are shocked. A message of faith that is received with faith will produce the miraculous. She was shocked. Don't lie to me, man of God. But you know the story. Nine months later, she brought forth a child. The prophet of God spoke those words to that woman who was barren all of her married life, and now she produced. The child began to grow, reaching an adolescent stage, and then he was out in the field working with his father, and he had a sunstroke. And he had some of the workers there carry the boy back to mama. He laid out, carried that boy back, laid it on the knees of this woman. And it says, there at noontime, the baby died. Notice the story, if you will, please. The boy died. Now, we have somebody die in our family, we call the undertaker. But this woman, I love her faith. She takes that dead boy and takes him up into the hole in the wall where she built that little place for the prophet and lay that baby on the prophet's bed. Her faith was searching for an answer. The man of God lay on that bed. Maybe some of that power still there. And she lay the baby on the prophet's bed, but there was no reviving. And the story goes on. She leaves the child and runs out into the field where her husband is and said, Saddle me a donkey. I gotta find the man of God. He said, What do you want to find him for? This ain't Sunday. This ain't no church day. This isn't a holy day. What do you want the man of God for, woman? Is everything all right? Remember, he just sent the boy back there. Is everything all right? She said, It shall. Be well. Boy, do I like this. This is my kind of woman. A woman who knew she was going to get an answer from God, and she even refused to accept the death of her son. She wouldn't even tell the man who was closer to her than anybody. If somebody dies in your family, your husband or the wife is going to be the first one to know it, but she never even mentioned death when the husband said, Is everything all right, girl? It shall be well. But I got to find the man of God. I like this. When trouble comes, find the man of God. Find somebody that knows how to pray the prayer of faith. Find somebody that knows how to bind the devil and loose you from the trouble that you're in because God has a way out of your dilemma. This is death. This is death. And that little woman gets on that donkey with one of the servants leading the way and she says, don't slow down for me, mister. Hit the road and don't slack up until, unless I tell you to slack. We gotta find the man of God. About four or five hours away, she finds the prophet. Now, you put four or five hours going and four and five hours coming back home. That's a full day. The boy died at noon. It's evening time. But she sets out four or five hours later, four or five in the afternoon, 
And then I come to the story that I read to you. The prophet of God in his old age, possibly his eyes are failing, but he sees the woman afar off. And he saw her coming. And I want you to know that this is a type of even God himself knowing that when trouble comes, his children have learned the lesson to come to him. And even when you're afar off, he's got his eye on you. Can you shout amen? amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What I'm trying to tell you is this. When trouble comes, don't wait until it's a total disaster to come to your father. But when trouble strikes, it's time to come running. You may be afar off, but come running anyway. His arms are wide open, waiting to receive you. And he's wanting to do something for you. Hallelujah. I believe this. And Elisha, when he saw... The woman afar off, he said to Gehazi, go to her. The crisis has come. And I want you to know, every one of you who are children of God, thank God for the blessing. Thank God for the blessing you have received from him. Thank God you're saved. Thank God you're sanctified. Thank God you're filled with the Holy Ghost. But you can't live in that blessing. There comes a time when every one of us comes to a crisis. There comes an hour of test and there comes an hour of trial. But you've got to learn how to hang on to the horns of the altar. God's not going to leave you. God's not going to forsake you. He said, I'm there with you wherever you are. And there is a way out of that crisis. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is the first meeting that woman had after she received that great blessing of that boy coming into that home. Just the husband and life and uh, husband and wife, and now the boy has been added, and now the boy has been taken away. This is her first meeting. After traveling those four and five hours away, he sends a messenger showing his affection that he's concerned about this woman. She's alone with her servant. The husband's not with her. There must be something. So he says to the messenger, Gehazi, ask her how it is with her husband. He's covering the whole scope of life. How is it with your husband? How is it with yourself? How is it with your child? Now, if everything's all right in that field, then everything must be all right. And every time the, the prophet's servant would ask her, how is it with your husband? How is it with yourself? She declared, it is well. 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 Oh, hallelujah. I believe that this literally thrilled the heart of God that no matter what comes into your life, even death itself, it is well. It is well. No matter when the doctor gives the report, that you're going to die and not live. It is well because eternal life beats within this breast. When you get through the mail, the divorce papers, it's not time to cry, but it's time to say, it is well. It is well. He may leave, she may leave, but you have somebody that'll stick closer than a brother. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He is a friend and he cares for every one of us. Raise your hands and shout amen. amen. I kind of love this man, Elisha. You don't hear many preachers say this because we know it all. But he said, the Lord hath hid it from me. Oh, I'm so glad he put that in there. Just to have him make a confession like this. The Lord hath hid it from me. A man like Elisha? I mean, he's a prophet of God. And he don't know what's wrong? I had a woman come to me once. She said, what's wrong with me? I said, what are you asking me for? I just come to lay hands on you. I just come to deliver you. Please don't tell me what's wrong. You'll mess up my faith. 
People always want to show me something. Can I show you where it hurts? I don't want to look at it. I lose what faith I have if I got to look at it. All he told me to do is pray the prayer of faith. I don't care how you look. I don't care how you act. I don't care what you're going through. I only know one thing. All things are possible to him that believeth. And God is going to turn it around and give you a miracle. Hallelujah. somebody and say, God's going to turn it around. <laughs> you know, the more I read this, the more I love it. I love the prophet for saying, the Lord hath hid it from me. And I believe this is the reason why, because the gal's getting wet. She's getting aggravated now. You know, always try to be at our best when we meet the man of God. Try to cover things up and hide them. He didn't see it. But boy, did she blow him away. Finally, she comes to the man of God and the cry of a bitter heart. She had some bitterness in there. She said, Did I desire a son? Oh, I like this. You messed me up, preacher. Me and my husband had no kids, so you come around with that faith talk. And you spoke that son into existence. You're the one that pointed your finger at me and said in nine months you're going to be pregnant. I mean, not pregnant. In nine months, you're going to bring forth a child. You can tell I don't have the babies. My wife does. <laughs> but I love this about the woman. I mean, she's laying the man out. I didn't ask for no son. Did I desire a son? She's saying, you forced it on me. I didn't ask for that, that blessing. Didn't I tell you, do not deceive me? She did. I read it to you. And now she's laying him out. But you know what? I, oh, I see something good about this. That's why she threw that baby on the prophet's bed and said, he's the one that got me into this mess. He's the one that prophesied over me. He's the one that told me I'm going to have a child. And now I'm going to go back to him and tell him he's going to prophesy one more time. And he's going to bring that baby back to life. <laughs> Woo! Do I like it? What am I trying to tell you? What I'm trying to tell you is this. God wants you to read that word. And when he says, I am the Lord that healeth thee, then you don't have to run off to the doctor, but you can run back to God and open it up and say, Hey, Lord, did you see what you said here? He doesn't want you to go to your preacher and argue with him, but go to the source. You said by your stripes I am healed. Now I believe that thing. So get to work and get me out of this mess. I'm no longer sick, but I am healed by your stripes. Isaiah said, who? believed our report and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed. The arm of the Lord is revealed only to them that believe the report. What report? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. 
we are healed. Who said it? God said it. Don't you argue with me about it. I didn't say it. I'm not the healer. Jesus is the healer. Here comes the little woman. Did I desire a son? I didn't ask for this. Here I was minding my own business and God saved me. I mean, I was living in sin, having a good time. When he messed me up, that Holy Ghost troubled the waters. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Some of you, he found your hiding place right out there on the street. Can you shout amen? Amen. The Holy Ghost came to you. You didn't come to him. He came to you first. And he tenderized your heart. You responded. How else can you respond to love? The song you just sang, when the love of God comes upon you, there's only one thing to do, and that's nestle up close against him. Hallelujah. He loved us when you're unlovely, when you're hooked on drugs, when you're bound by alcohol, when you're living a life of sin. Nobody loves you but Jesus. He reaches down into the depths of sin, picks you up, washes you in his blood, takes out an old stony heart, puts in a heart of flesh, clothes you with his righteousness, and then calls you son. Hallelujah. I love him. I said I love him. Elijah couldn't, Elijah couldn't take all this. He saw the bitterness pouring out of her heart. Oh, I, a lot of us know what it is to have that bitterness there. When you go through troubles, you say, Why, Lord? That old jug pusher living next door to me, no one never goes through anything. Here I'm living sanctified, and I've got to go through all this hell. <laughs> Why? Shut up! <laughs> he's got everything under control. I said he's got everything under control. You are being led of the Spirit. God is leading you in the paths of righteousness. He's looking for somebody who will be obedient under his cry. That no matter where he leads, you'll follow right in his footstep. Because you know what the end is going to be. Can you shout amen? amen? Hallelujah. I'm talking about a God that is concerned with you. Here she is, laying at his feet, getting a hold of the feet. Wouldn't let him go anywhere. He got a hold of Gehazi and he said, here, take my staff, man. Get on home. Something's wrong with that boy. Lay that staff on his face. She held on tighter. She said, you can send that Sunday school superintendent if you want to. <laughs> she said, I want the man to come with me. You're the one that prophesied. You're the one that told me I was going to have a child. You're going back with me. You can send him if you want to, but I'm going to wait for you. You're coming with me. My God, I like that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some folks are content to get the touch of a man's hand. But I'd rather have the touch of the man's hand. Oh, hallelujah. Put your hand in the hand of the man that stilled the water. You guys think you can sing. (laughs) Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. One touch from that hand, it'll turn the situation around. It'll open your blind eyes. The paralysis will leave your body. You'll be able to rise up and walk. Strength will come into your body because he is the great physician. Can you raise your hands and shout amen? You know, I tried to justify this. Why would Elisha send his staff home? with his servant. And I dare say that his mind went back to the time when Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind. 
and he picked up a worn out mantle after Elijah was gone and he picked up Elijah's mantle and come back to the Jordan and he said where is the Lord God of Elijah and when the mantle struck the water whoosh, whoosh, it backed up he said I'll come over here on dry ground and I'm going back on dry ground And the man of God used a worn out mantle. And I can picture him going through those waters saying, All right! It works! And he gave him his staff, possibly believing that the staff would produce the miracle. But the woman held on. Her faith is no Sunday school superintendent. <laughs> Nobody else but you. Gehazi took the staff home and lay it on the boy's body, on his face. And I can picture him jabbing him a little bit with it. Slapping him. You can't hurt no dead boy anyway. The boy wouldn't respond. And finally he went back and he met Elijah, or Elisha rather, and the Shunammite. And he said, it don't work. And I was studying and praying over this today. It don't work. Why didn't it work? The staff didn't work. Possibly. Now listen. Because you all know the story. After Elisha died, they put him in a grave. Decomposition set in and nothing left but his skeleton. And one day, during a warfare, they were burying a body. And the enemy came, surprised them. Those that were bearing, and they quickly threw the body into the grave where Elisha's bones were. And when the dead body touched the bones of Elisha, he come alive. His old dead bones brought life. Don't you think his staff ought to bring life? But it never happened. And I began to wonder, maybe it was because of the unbelief of the bearer of the staff. What's the use of having your pastor lay hands on you if he don't believe in healing? I've had preachers come to me and say, I don't have anything in my hands. Well, then don't put them on me. I have something in my hands. I have something in me. Got it in my feet. Got it in my head. Got it all over me. What is it? It's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. It dwells in you. It dwells in you. The same spirit. It's a resurrecting spirit. It lives in you. It abides in you. And it brings life. When I lay hands on somebody, I expect something to happen. I expect miracles to take place. And I can picture Gehazi when he met Elisha. Forget it. Forget it. The boy's dead. Well, I ain't going to forget it. That woman says, you coming with me, with me, mister. You get that Sunday school superintendent out of the way. You going with me. You're going to my house. And when they come to the house, I love it. And I call this the communicated power. You can communicate what you have to somebody else. 
Elisha keeps the woman outside of the room. Keeps, good thing he kept Gehazi out of there. Because later you find out what Gehazi had in his life when he tried to sell what Elisha refused to get from Naaman. You know the story? That's why I said, in an unprofitable servant's hand. Oh, while I'm on this, let me just say, you better be careful who you get to lay hands on you. Gehazi couldn't make it work. But Elisha went up into the bedchamber. He knew his apartment. The boy is lying in his bed. And when he sees that little boy in that condition, death, he stretched out on him. Mouth to mouth. Eyeball to eyeball. You're the director, aren't you? <laughs> mouth to mouth, eyeball to eyeball. No wonder he closed the door. Everybody would have thought he's nuts. I wonder if he'd have done that on television. In front of all the world. Crazy things. He said, I wouldn't do that. And nobody would come alive either. <laughs> he stretched out on that little body, and before long, it started to warm. What's he doing? He's communicating his power into a dead corpse. The boy has been dead since 12 o'clock noon. He's a pale corpse. It's close to the evening hour now. A five or a six hour ride on a donkey one way and five or six hours back. It's late evening. It's too late. Oh, yeah? When you get to heaven, ask Brother Lazarus. You see where I'm coming from, folks? God's never too late. I said God's never too late. Betty Jean said earlier, He may not come when you want Him, but He's always on time. God will make a way. Hallelujah. He stretched out on that corpse. I believe he talked to it. You better listen to me, boy. When I tell you to get up, you better get up. Slap him a little bit. Mm, mm. You better listen to me. That's a dead boy. You say, Lord, I'm alive and my mama does that to me. He gets up off of that body. That boy ain't up yet. Pacing the floor, walking around. In his heart, I believe he's crying out to God. Lord, you've got to answer this woman's cry. That woman, you see how she grabbed my feet? She ain't going to take no for an answer. Them women are crazy, Lord. They ain't going to give up. You know, it's something about a woman. They don't give up. You know, us men, we give up, but them women don't give up. My wife kept chasing me till she got me. You know that? She just don't give up. Please don't let her tell the story now. <laughs> but you know, in church, I love these women. A little woman said, if he ain't going to touch me, I'm going to touch him. And she pressed her way through the crowd and touched the hem of that garment. And, uh, and happened transferred power the virtue of Christ came into her and she felt in her body she was healed of that plague you listening to me folks communicated power Lord you gotta answer that cry let me get back on the saddle again got back on that boy mouth to mouth 
eyeball to eyeball, hand to hand. Put his hand on his hand. Eyes on his eyes. Now, if you was a good-looking woman, I'd put my eyes on your eyes. But let me over here at my wife. I'll, I'll do it right. Give me a hand, honey. Put your eyes on my eyes. And put my nose on your nose. Put your lips, oh, Lord. That's... I can only do that with my wife, you see. But here he is, back on that little boy's body, a dead corpse. You wouldn't do that. You stay far away from them corpses. Not me. You know, when I first got saved, I saw T.L. Osborne open blind eyes, not stop deaf ears. Every funeral I went to. Every funeral I went to, Paul. I didn't do it publicly. I said, oh, Lord, I'm going to go touch them. And when I touch them, let them get up. Did you ever do that? Oh, I knew it, Jan. How many of you ever did that? Ooh. You did it too. You know you don't want to make a fool out of yourself. You were in that business, burying the dead. That's why you got out of it. You came alive. Let the dead bury the dead. And I'd say it under my breath. I'd get a hold of that dead hand and say, In the name of Jesus, get up! <laughs> I'd hold on to that cold hand. Inside I'd say, Listen to me, man. <laughs> Never did get up. But I believe if I'd have stretched myself out on them, they would have. He communicated. You know what Peter said after he got the Holy Ghost? He said to that man who was a cripple all of his life, 40 years in a condition, he said, what I have, give I unto you. I love that statement. What I have, I give. You can't give what you don't have. And he looked at him and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. The man said, what? What do you think I'm sitting here for, man? I can't walk. Peter said, I didn't come to ask, why are you here? I said, get up and walk. He reached out and got him by the hand now. And when he got him by the hand, something come out of Peter and went into that man. And he lifted him up and it says immediately his ankle bones received strength. He communicated what he had to a cripple. Elisha communicated what he had to a dead man. I believe I told this before, but it'll bear repeating. I had my tent up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, on a graveyard. And I'm not talking about a church parking lot. This was a real graveyard. And that's the only lot I could find. But I didn't tell the folks it was a graveyard. We had the greatest revival I believe we ever had. And I was preaching one night and a man in the fourth row died. And I refuse to let the devil kill anybody in a Holy Ghost revival. I jumped off that platform, ran through four rows of chairs. He lost his control of his bladder. The lady next to him loosened his tie. His head was back, tongue. His eyes were in the back of the head. I mean dead. Dead, dead. And I ran back through there and I said, everybody pray with me. Quick, pray! And I rebuked death in the name of Jesus. I commanded his spirit to come back into his body. But he wouldn't talk to me. Call my tent man. Come down here. Get him out of here. Take him. Dump him behind that curtain. Ain't no devil killing my sermon. 
And I went on preach 30 more minutes. <laughs> Gave an altar call, 500 people got saved. <laughs> Laid hands on the people. God started healing folks. I forgot all about that dead man. <laughs> I went back to the motel and went to bed. Three o'clock in the morning, I sat straight up in that bed. And the thought hit me, that dead man. I said, oh, Lord, I forgot all about that dead man. That's awful to confess this on national television, isn't it? Well, I just laid back down again. I said, well, I'll let the night watchman handle that situation. And I went back the next night to preach. Before I started preaching, I said, I want five of the happiest people to jump up. Tell me why you're happy. Come up here. Here comes a well-dressed man. Four other people come a-running. He was first. I put the microphone to his lips. I said, why are you happy? He said, I died dead last night. I pulled the microphone from him. I said, what kind of nut is this? How else can you die but dead? And he looked. I was a little perturbed. He said, Brother Shamrock, don't you remember me? I said, no, sir. He said, last night I was in the fourth row. I died. He said, I had my fifth heart attack. Listen to the story. Don't turn the TV set off. Fifth heart attack in church. Now listen, before I go on with the rest of the story, I can't think of a better place to die than in church. I'd rather die in church than a butcher shop, I mean a hospital. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you rather die in church? Hey Amen, just go right out of here. But this man, he's testifying. He said, Brother Shambach, I died, I had my fifth heart attack. And when you called my spirit out of my body, he said, I was out of it. I saw you running through those rows of chairs. But he said, last night, I wasn't saved. If you hadn't have done what you did, I'd have been in hell. But you saved me from a devil's hell. Think about this. Think about it. But he said, I saw you running through four rows of seats. But he said, when I came to, he said, how did I get behind that platform? I said, forget the platform. We'll talk about that later. Tell me the story. He said, I want you to know I woke up. Everybody was gone, but I was back here in the back of that tent behind that platform. And he said, this morning when I woke up, I went back to my medical doctor and he examined me and told me that there's no more scars. He said, I had four scars on that heart. And he said, I told you if you have another attack, you're going to die. But he said, where were you, man? You don't even have the four scars that were there. You have a brand new heart. He said, Jesus Christ came into my life last night and now I'm not going to die, but I'm going to live. Can you shout, praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wish I could finish this. We are communicators of life. When we lay hands on you, we're communicating life to you. In the name of Jesus. Sometimes it doesn't come right away. Elisha had to go back and lay on that body again. It happened over a process of time. But you rest assured when you are ministered to and when hands are laid on you, you are going to reverse your situation and life is coming into your being. Listen to me. You that have never experienced Christ in your life, I'm going to communicate life to you. Look at me. You can have your name on every church book in your city and go to hell. You must be born again. And I'm going to communicate life to you. 
Don't turn the TV set off. This will be the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle. Jesus Christ is going to transform you by his power. Bow your heads, everybody, please. Satan, I bind you in the name of Jesus. And I command you to loose your hold on everyone that's listening. Every, every drug addict, every alcoholic, every sinner, every backslider. That backslidden preacher that left the pulpit. Run off with another woman. You flipped it on. God loves you, mister. You're going to preach this gospel. If you don't preach it in New York, you'll preach it in hell. God's giving you another opportunity. Thank God for Christian television. You that are here tonight, listen to me. This is one man I saved from hell when I rebuked death. I wish I could be there. When you die, I don't know that. But every one of you watching this telecast, I want you to dial that number on your screen. Hundreds of people are waiting for your call right now. That number's on your screen right now. Dial it. Somebody's waiting to pray for you. And I'll guarantee you, you'll have the greatest miracle of your life. All you got to do is dial the number. When you dial it, it may be busy because hundreds of people are dialing. Hang it up. Try it again. You'll get through. Let God know you're persistent. You're not going to give up. You're going to hang in there until you break through. And you'll find somebody on the other end of that line. Thank you for watching Voice of Power. If you'd like to write to Dr. Shambach, the address is R.W. Shambach, P.O. Box A, Santa Ana, California, 92711. This program has been sponsored by the Trinity Broadcasting Network and your contributions. Aren't you glad the Word of God works? Put it in your heart and let it bring forth fruit. I trust you've enjoyed today's telecast, and I want to thank you for allowing me the privilege of coming into your home. Now, if you enjoy this telecast, I want you to write Paul and Jan a letter and let them know about it. They don't know unless you tell them. And when you write them, tuck in a little love gift and let them know that you want it to continue. That'll let them know you really enjoy it. Now, if you want any other information about our ministry, why don't you write me personally in our Tyler headquarters office. That's R.W. Schambach, Tyler, Texas, 75703. That's all the address you need. It's there on your screen. And if you have any prayer requests or anything you'd like to talk to me about, I'll be glad to answer your letter. So get the letter in the mail today. And don't forget to tell your friends about the next week's telecast.